uh, talking to my kids in bed last night and talking to them. And, uh, my, my Lena Joy, my little girl, she said, she said, what, what time are you getting up? I said, well, I'm going to get up at six. I want you to set an alarm for a little bit before that because I want to wake up before you do. Uh, they brought Nerf guns to camp this year. Um, so they, uh, she said, I want to get up because I want to surprise you and I want to shoot you in the morning. Um, <laughs> I thought that's nice. And, and so I've sort of explained to her that there wasn't any chance that I was going to be setting an alarm for her for 6 a.m. Um, and so we kind of worked through that. Well, lo and behold, I got up at 6 and sat down and was starting to drink a cup of coffee, opened the Bible, and, and I heard some footsteps. And my son, Evan Daniel, he usually wakes up early, so I thought maybe it was just him. And, and uh, I, I peeked over to the corner of their door, and of course I see the barrel of the gun sticking out. <laughs> and she nailed me. Uh, she smiled and waved and went back to bed. Um, <laughs> so that's how my morning started out. We are talking this week about becoming who we are, becoming who you are, discovering and finding our identity in Christ. And yesterday we talked about being children of God. And there is just such an amazing, amazing picture and privilege that we have uh, in being called God's child. Nothing is more amazing. It's so familiar. But it's so amazing. And this morning we're going to look at an, at an aspect of our identity that I think often we don't, don't think about. I think it's an aspect of our identity that many times we overlook. Uh, but it's an identity that's just as amazing and just as spectacular as being called a child of God. Uh, we're going to begin in 1 Peter uh, in just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. We're going to look at several different scripture passages this morning. But as Peter is, is writing to the early church, he's writing to them during a time of very intense persecution. All right, the early believers were being persecuted for their faith in Christ, for turning to Jesus as their Messiah. They were persecuted by their own Jewish brothers. Right, who did not recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. And so persecution has become intense. And then the Roman government also will persecute them. So Peter is writing to a, a church that is under duress. And, and one of the things that he chooses to do in writing to a church that was experiencing persecution was to remind them of their identity. To make sure that they understood who they were. Because here's something that's so crucial to understand. What you believe affects what you do. All right, Behavior always flows out of belief. Whenever we enact in a behavior, whether we realize it or not, we are engaging in what we actually believe. All right, Our behavior is a great indicator of what we actually believe. And if we believe incorrectly, we will behave incorrectly. If we're going to live out the life that God's called us to, if we're going to live out the plan and the purpose that He's created us for, if we're going to discover the divine destiny that He's written for each and every one of us as His children, we need to understand who we are. We need to believe the right things about ourselves so that we'll behave in the right way. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And so Peter reminds his readers and ultimately all of us as he's writing under the influence and the direction of the Holy Spirit. He says, you're a chosen people. You're a child of God. You belong to your Father in heaven. And he says, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. This is a quotation from the Old Testament scriptures. And Peter's readers, his original readers who were Jewish in their upbringing and had come to faith in Christ would have been immediately familiar with these words. They would have been words that they had heard and read and probably memorized. And so now Peter applies that to them in Christ. And he says, yes, this was the heritage of God's people, Israel, but this is also the heritage of everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. He says, this is who you are, and you need to understand who you are to live in a world that's very difficult. And so this morning, I want us to narrow in on that second one, that royal priesthood. And I want us to think this morning about our identity as a priest. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you think about yourself as a priest? All right, how many of you call yourself a priest? All right, none of you. All right, so this morning... Yesterday was very familiar, child of God, we've all heard that, although we don't always get it. This morning, less familiar, but no less important. 
And we're going to discover this morning what it means to be a priest. A priest is one who mediates on behalf of another, a go-between. And so his early listeners would have understood very much what a priest was because the priesthood was an important part uh, of the Jewish faith. And so they understood the role of the priest. They understood the role of their high priest. All right. There was one who was selected as the high priest and it was his job, his role, once a year to go into what was called the Holy of Holies, the innermost part of the temple. He could only go there once a year and he had to make a sacrifice first for himself, for his own sin. He had to make a sacrifice on behalf of the people of the nation and then he would enter the very presence of God. And it was behind a very thick veil, a very thick curtain. And so the Jewish people very much aware of God's holiness and God's presence, that God, God's presence is something to be esteemed as, as very, very holy. And so understanding that and thinking about this role of a priest, which was held in great honor and great esteem, they knew that only he could go before God's presence on behalf of them. They realized their sinfulness that separated them from the presence of God. But when Jesus came, he did something unimaginable. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, tells us about it. Because here's the thing. Jesus came as God's answer for that separation. Jesus came as God's solution for the separation that mankind endured because of our sin and our rebellion against God. The curtain was an ever-present reminder that there was a barrier between man and God, that our sin was a problem in knowing God and relating to God and experiencing Him because God is holy. He doesn't tolerate sin. He doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't excuse sin. And so their sin was ever before them. They knew they could not go beyond the veil. But Jesus came to break down that barrier. In John chapter 1 verse 29, before we get to, to Matthew, it says, this was John the Baptist describing Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John the Baptist describes Jesus as the Lamb, the sacrifice who will take away the sin of the world. And Jesus dies on a cross. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. You don't have to turn there. Just, just listen. Hebrews chapter 9, uh, beginning in verse 11, actually. It says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest. All right, so Jesus comes and he takes on the role of the high priest. Of the, as a high priest of the good things that have come. Then through a greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of creation, he entered once for all the holy places, not by means of blood, the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And so Jesus Christ is pictured as the Lamb of God. He very intentionally dies at Passover to represent that. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, look at what it says about what happens when Jesus, the Lamb of God, Right? Our great high priest who secured for us forgiveness not through a sacrifice of an animal but through his own life, his own blood. And it says when this happened, it says in Matthew chapter 27 verse 50, then Jesus shouted out again and he gave up his spirit and at that moment the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. I mean think about that. This thick veil, this separation, this powerful symbol that mankind separated from the presence of God is torn from the top to the bottom, demonstrating that it was God doing the tearing. Jesus was breaking down the barrier that existed between man and God. And because Jesus became our high priest, all right, the mediator, the one who goes between, right, because you and I, by nature, are at odds with God, right? We all have a problem with God, right? Are you with me? All right, that problem is what? Sin. All right, yesterday you all raised your hands. You all confessed, right? You all admitted that you were sinners, right? We have all rebelled against God, right? And that gives us, and that puts us at odds with God. We have a problem with God. Jesus came to mediate that problem that we have with God. He came to offer that solution, and he did so by sacrificing his own life. He became the lamb. He became the sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice that could 
in and of itself atone for sin. The Bible says the blood of bulls and goats could never, ever pay for the sin. It only symbolized what was to come, and that was Christ. And when Jesus died, the temple, in the temple, the curtain was torn. The separation that existed between man and God was broken down. That barrier was eliminated. And now you and I have access to the presence of God. If you are in Christ, right, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've come by faith, believing that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he lived a life that you couldn't live, that he died the death you deserve to die, that he rose from the dead. And if you believe that, and if you've staked your eternal destiny to that belief, right, then you are now a child of God, but you are now also a priest to your God. Because he has given you the right, the authority to enter his presence. And he has made you to become a kingdom of priests. You're part of a royal priesthood. And so through the gospel, we have been given the authority to be a priest. You have access to God through your high priest, Jesus Christ. Standing this that will change the way that we behave. When you and I see ourselves as a priest, it will radically affect how we live. It will affect how we think about our relationship with God. You and I have been made to be a kingdom of priests. We have access and authority from God to be a priest. Why? Because Jesus is our high priest. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Right, we said, we all have a problem with God. And listen, humanity everywhere, even people who have never heard of the gospel, even people who have never heard of the God of the universe, they don't know him, but they, you know what they know? They know they have a problem. Right, I, I've been in the jungle of Peru. I've been among people who are very unreached with the gospel, and they know that there's a problem. They are very religious. They are spiritual. They try to do things to atone for their sin. They recognize that, although they don't know exactly how or why. They know they have a problem. We realize intuitively that we are at odds with God. But there is only one way, one way to become right with God. And that's through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no one else, nobody else, nothing else that can make you right with God. There's no one that can mediate the difference that you have with God, reconcile the fact that you're at odds with God other than Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Right? No one else can be a priest for you. No one else can mediate the covenant. Only Jesus can. We, there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Jesus was man. He was God. And as such, he was able to accomplish for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so Jesus Christ, now, today, serves as your high priest. Right? The Bible says that he is ever interceding for his children. He prays for you. He goes to the Father on your behalf. Right? You're his children. You're heirs of his promises. He's brought you into his covenant and he's brought you into his priesthood. So you now are a priest. In Christ, you're a priest. All right? So now when you introduce yourself, you can introduce yourself that way, right? Eric? Um, where did it go? I was just looking at you, then I couldn't see you. Um, you can now introduce yourself as Priest Eric. All right? I'm Priest Eric. I'm a priest to my God. All right? That's who you are. Now, I really don't suggest introducing yourself to people that way. All right? It's, it would be a little awkward. But it is really important that you understand that that is part of of who you are. You are a priest. What does that mean practically? How, how then do we live if our identity, if, if, if I see myself as God's priest, if, if I believe that, that, that what God says is true, that, that Jesus Christ has become my high priest and he has made me to be a priest to God. How does that affect how I live? How, how does what I believe, how should that shape and affect the way I behave? And I, I just want to share two, two sort of key things this morning with you about that. Number one, it reminds us that we have the great privilege of entering God's presence. Right? The veil has been torn and you and I can experience the presence of God. 
Right? Not because we're worthy, not because we deserve it, but because Jesus Christ is worthy. And Jesus Christ went to the cross and he paid for your sin. He paid for your guilt. He paid for your rebellion. He died in your place. He bore the Father's wrath on your behalf. He died, but he rose from the dead. And he invites you and I by faith to receive him as our Savior, to know him as our Lord, to worship him and experience him. And he says, now through Jesus Christ we have access into the presence of God. Think about that. You have access to the presence of God. You have the same access to the presence of God that I have and that every other believer has. There are no special classes of people in Christ. Are you with me? Right. We are all priests to our God. Your prayers have the same access to God as mine. Right? A lot of times as a pastor, the, oh, we need to get the pastor to pray for this. As though I have sort of have some sort of special line to God. Right? And I'm glad to pray for them. But you have the same ability to enter the presence of God that I have and that anyone else has. Because Jesus Christ is your high priest. He has mediated and reconciled the difference that you had with God. And so we have the great privilege of entering God's presence. We can do so boldly. Look at Hebrews 4.16. It says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Right? We can enter the presence of God. We can go beyond the veil. We can go into the holy of holies. Not because we are holy, but because Jesus is holy. And we go with him because he lives in us. He is our righteousness. And so we enter the presence of God and it says, there we will receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help when we need it most. You have been invited as God's priest to enjoy his presence. And we need his presence, don't we? We need to be refreshed often in the presence of God. And so we have this amazing privilege to spend time with our God. Right? We often talk about having a devotional life or a quiet time or we use different words for that. And sometimes it's really hard, isn't it? Right? Sometimes it's the easiest thing to skip in your day. And Satan will do anything to distract you from your time with God because it's so important. But if you'll remember, I'm a priest to my God. This is part of who I am. And so I don't just, I don't just have to spend time with God or should spend time with God. I get to spend time with God. I've been invited. The priesthood was held in high esteem in Israel. The high priest had this incredible privilege of going before the presence of God once a year. But now you have been invited anytime, anywhere through Jesus Christ to enter the presence of God, to find his mercy and his grace and his help when you need it. As a priest, we have the great privilege of entering the presence of God. Number two, when we realize that we're a priest, we will offer up our lives as a living sacrifice. When you realize that you're a priest... You will offer up your life as a sacrifice to God. All right, that's what the priests would do, right? They would bring the sacrifices to God. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says this, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Right? Listen to that. He says, you, like a living stone, you're being built up into a spiritual house. What? To be a holy priesthood. You're part of a holy priesthood. So what? That you can offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. God has saved you so that you can know Him and worship Him. Right? We have the great privilege as God's priest to worship Him. To know Him. To experience His presence. To offer sacrifices to Him. To live a life of worship. Right, to live a life that reflects who God is and what he's done in your life. That's God's heart for you and God's desire that you would be a worshiper. That you would be someone through whom your life, through your lips, through your tongue, through your words, through your songs, through your actions, through your service, through everything that you do. Right? That you would offer your life as an act of worship to God. Paul said whether we eat or whether we drink, whatever we do, do all to what? The glory of God. Right? He says everything is an act of worship if you're a priest to your God. Right? He says you can eat to the glory of God. Right? Amen? Amen. 
Amen. All right, we can eat to God's glory. We can, we can rejoice in His provision and His goodness. It says we can do everything to God's glory. We can offer our music to God as an act of worship. We can offer our lives. We can do everything to the glory of God. I'm pretty sure that you can even play Frisbee to the glory of God. All right? I, I, I think God enjoys watching His kids play Frisbee. I think he gets great humor out of it, at least when he watches me, all right? And all the funny faces and awkward positions that I find myself in. Um, Dr. Harding told you uh, in introductions that he teaches Frisbee. I do not teach Frisbee, all right? I play Frisbee. Do not learn from me, all right? My techniques are not, not what you should emulate. You're a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Romans 12 fleshes out for us a little bit about what that looks like. About living this life of worship. And in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, Paul says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, because of the mercies of God, because you've experienced God's mercy, right? Because you have, you have experienced him withholding his judgment. He has given you grace instead. He says, I appeal to you therefore, for, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He says, here's the thing. If you're a priest unto your God, if you're a worshiper of your God, here is the sacrifice, right? Because worship should always cost us something, right? Worship that costs us nothing means nothing. If your worship doesn't cost you something, if there is not any value or worth in it, then it is meaningless worship. And so God calls us to give Worship to him that is worthy of who he is. And Paul says the most worthy thing, the most worthy act of worship that you can commit is to present your body, your life, as a living sacrifice. He says, present your body as a living sacrifice. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, he says what? I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So this idea of being a living sacrifice was not something that Paul just wrote about. He lived it out. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God has called us to a life of worship where we offer ourselves to God. He says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, because of God's mercy. Never forget what God has done for you. Never forget that you were rebellious against him. Never forget that you were once separated and alienated from God. Never forget that your sin was a barrier. It separated you from the holy God who made you. But in his mercy and in his grace, he's offered you redemption through Jesus Christ. And he's redeemed you. He's bought you. He purchased you. He's declared you his child. He's made you a priest to God. And he says, now present your body as a living sacrifice, holy. That means set apart for him. Different. He says, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. The greatest way that you can worship God is not through a song, although music is a powerful, powerful form of worship. Right? The greatest act of worship is not doing things for God as though he needs you to do things for him, right? It's a pretty crazy thought to think that God needs us, right? God does not need you, although you may think you're God's gift to the world, right? God does not need me. If I died today, and I hope that I don't, I'm not planning on it, but if I died today, God's plan would not be in any way stopped or thwarted. The life would go on. Jehi would go on, right? Right? God does not need any of us, but he offers us the privilege of serving Him. And the greatest act of worship is not a song. It's not doing something for God. It's saying, God, here is my life. I recognize that it's yours. You purchased it. You bought it with the price of the blood of your son. And I want to offer it to you as an act of worship. In your role as a priest, you have the great privilege of entering God's presence. But you also have the great privilege of offering worship to God. And the greatest way that you can worship God is to say, God, here is my life. And I want you to know there's nothing greater than you can do in life than to give God what he's already purchased, right? His kingdom is coming. And he calls you through the gospel to live for what matters, to live for his kingdom, to live for his glory. And understanding your role, your identity as a priest will help 
you do that. When you see yourself as a priest, when you see yourself the way God sees you, right, it will affect the way that you behave. As, as I think, I am a priest to my God. If I wake up in the morning and, and I think, I am a priest to my God, I have the amazing privilege to go enter His presence I can open his word and and hear from him. I can go to him in prayer and talk to him. I can listen to his voice because I'm a priest to my God. I have now the great privilege today to serve him and to offer up my life as an act of worship to him because of who I am. When you see yourself the way God sees you, when you believe what he has already declared you to be, you'll become who you are and it will change the way that you live. It will change the way that we live. You have been called to live out your faith in a world that is becoming increasingly hostile to the gospel. When Peter wrote to the early church and reminded them of who they were, the world was hostile to the gospel. And in this world that is increasingly hostile to the gospel, it's so important that you understand who you are, that you are anchored in your identity in Christ. So that you can live out your faith in a dark world representing the light of Jesus Christ. Remember, he's called us out of darkness, right? And into his light. And he wants us to reflect that light to this world. And even though the world may seem to be hostile to the gospel, listen, God is still using the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to transform and change people's hearts and lives. Jesus Christ is building his kingdom. And he's invited you and I to be part of that. I want you to see yourself the way God sees you. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. As John shares in this revelation that Jesus gives him and he describes some things, he begins by saying in verse 6, he says, He has made us his kingdom and his what? His priests who serve before God his Father. Give to him everlasting glory. He rules forever and ever. Amen. That's the priesthood that you and I have been called into. And so as a priest to God, I want to challenge you. Seek to enter His presence daily. Be a worshiper of God. Spend time with God, not because you have to, not because you should, but because you can. Because the veil has been torn. Because the barrier between you and God has been broken down through Jesus Christ, who was and is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, who offered his blood as a once and for all sacrifice for your sin and for my sin. Number two, as a priest to God, offer your life as a living sacrifice each and every day. Choose to see yourself that way. Believe that that's who you are and it will change the way that you live. God has invited you to this glorious, glorious privilege. I want to close with these words. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. The author of Hebrews says, Therefore, brothers, since we have this confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. Right? Remember the veil has been torn? He says, This new and living way that's been opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. Jesus did it himself. He died as your sacrifice. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Jesus went beyond the veil for you and he tore it down. He is your high priest. He alone mediates the covenant that he wants to establish between You and the Father. There's no other name given by which men can be saved. There's no other way to be right with God than Jesus Christ. No church, no denomination, no amount of good behavior can't keep all the rules. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. He is your high priest and he calls you to be his priest and to see yourself that way. To offer your life as a spiritual sacrifice to him. The question is, Is he worthy? Do you believe that the one who died for you and who rose again, who rules and reigns on high, who's coming again one day in power and glory, is he worthy of your life? And if he is, would you offer your life as a spiritual act of worship each and every day? Let me pray for you this morning.
Father, I pray this morning that we would become completely overwhelmed with how awesome you are, how great you are, how glorious you are. Father, I pray that we would never, ever, ever forget that we were separated from your glory and your splendor. Father, that we were cut off, but that through your son Jesus, you rescued us and redeemed us. That Jesus himself became the curse, that he died for us. That he rose on high and that through him we can be forgiven, that the veil is torn. And Father, may we never lose sight of who we are now and the great privilege that we have. And Father, may we believe that you are worthy of our lives. And may we live as your priests. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.